Jubilee family, this is Aurora and my plant babies wanting to encourage you. During these uncertain times, let us remember that God is the one constant thing that we can continuously count on. And I look forward to worshiping with you again soon. I miss you all so much. Good morning, Jubilee Church. We are the Harvey family. I'm Ross. This is Blythe. This is Caleb. And that's Anna, who you probably can't see. We love you. We miss you. And we really are looking forward to worshiping again in person. Uh, but in the meanwhile, we pray that you have a blessed Sunday morning, the Sabbath day, as we enjoy God's word and worship him together. Amen. Amen. Bye. Bye. We have nowhere to go, so we never late. We stay home, work and create. We celebrate. Fruit and veg in a crate, getting fitter at any rate. Missing our friends, restaurants, a coffee date. Enough already. Getting impatient, we wait. Into God's hands we surrender our fate. Lots of love, the Lochenberg family. Hi everyone, welcome to Church Online. My name is Ajwa and I'm part of the evening service at Jubilee Observatory. I'm definitely missing seeing each and every one of you at church and at life group and looking forward to when we can all meet again. Hello and welcome to Jubilee Community Church's online service. I'm Lester Pillay. And I'm Lisa Pillay and we're part of the leadership team in Jubilee in the city. And we would like to wish you a great time with us this morning or whatever time you're joining us today. One of the joys of this extended lockdown and the worship time we've had at church is that we get to sing and dance with our boys in our lounge and enjoy Jesus with kiddie instruments and whatever fun we can have. Uh, Psalm 29 verse 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. So church, let us enjoy Jesus today. Get off your couch, get off your bed, grab your air guitar, your drums, your triangle, whatever works for you, and let's sing along together and worship with the music provided.
great mercy in light of all you 
you've done I present my life as a living sacrifice in view of your great mercy in light of all you've done I will love you God with all my strength and heart Lord this is my worship in Oh! 
Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness to us. Thank you that we get to enjoy you, uh, to worship you, to sing, and just have fun being in your presence, uh, whether it's in our bedroom, uh, whether it's in a lounge, or whether it's if we gathered uh, one day together. We just enjoy being your children and enjoying worshiping you. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Let's start by crossing to our Kids News Desk team with Skippy and his sidekick, Nathan. Welcome back to Jubilee Kids News. Many of you might be wondering, why are there tomatoes at Skippy's feet? I asked him that same question, and he said, because I want all of Jubilee to know that Jesus loves me from my head to my toes. Um, now, in the news this week, we have had new cases of Skippy fever continuing to pop up. And just when we started thinking, maybe you're safe if you don't have a penguin. Thanks to Greg and Ruth's Gangan, that is no longer the case, as she knit them their very own Skippies. Gangan has kindly made her knitting pattern available to us, so if you would like to knit your very own Skippy, please feel free to contact us at the Jubilee Kids phone. Now, another reminder to please keep sending us your self-portraits for a chance to win a limited edition set of skin tone coloring pencils, Adult of Jubilee, that includes you. We've had some amazing entries this week. Please keep them coming in. Well, that's it from us here at Jubilee Kids News. As always, I've been Nathan, that's been Skippy, you've been you, and most true of all, Jesus loves you. As you know, we are launching our popular equip course on the 19th of August. The course will happen over three weeks on Zoom every Wednesday evening. We are hosting a four course track, which are parenting, biblical steps towards racial harmony, a Bible study in Zephaniah, the first steps to helping you pray, read your Bible, and use your spiritual gifts. You can sign up today on the Jubilee website under the calendar tab. And I know many of us were truly blessed and challenged by last week's sermon. So we're going to hand over to Stephen and Anna for part two of their discussion on marriage. Hello everyone, welcome to part two of our two-part series on Christian marriage based on Ephesians 5 verses 21 to 33. It's the fullest treatment of marriage in the New Testament. The series isn't designed just to help married couples. As we said last week, there's no better time uh, to get a vision for Christian marriage than when you are single. Uh, getting a vision for Christian marriage uh, will help protect you either for an unhealthy over-desire for marriage or a under-desire for marriage altogether. Even if you remain single, which the Bible calls a spiritual gift, Having a biblical vision of marriage will help you to support, encourage, and protect Christian marriage, which will help the church and society at large. Let's look together at Ephesians 5, verses 21 to 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. So last week, we looked at gospel equality and gospel roles, and we saw that there was radical equality between husband and wife, but that there's also differing roles assigned by God. Last week, we did more of the theological heavy lifting, 
And this week, we want to focus on the application that Paul gives us in this passage. And we want to do that under three headings. Uh, Firstly, cultivating your garden. Secondly, renew the covenant. And thirdly, serve the king. Let's begin with cultivating your garden. Even a superficial reading of Ephesians chapter 5 will tell you that uh, a God-glorifying marriage requires hard work. It requires both husband and wife investing in the marriage relationship. If our marriage is uh, simply left, it will regress and need help. Our marriage is never static. Either we are investing in it and it's moving forward, or we're not and it's moving backward. We like to think that caring for our marriage is like cultivating a garden. And firstly, what's needed is the right kind of soil, gospel soil, gospel equality, and an embrace of God's design. If we ignore those instructions, it will be like trying to grow a garden in a wasteland. You can work as hard as you want on it, but you're not going to get gospel outcomes if you don't do it God's way. Next, we need to be planting seeds. Having great soil is a good start, but it isn't enough. We need to be planting seeds if we want to get a harvest. Proverbs 20 verse 4 tells us, The slacker does not plow during planting season. At harvest time, he looks and there is nothing. If you aren't planting anything, you can't expect uh, to reap a harvest. And here in Ephesians 5, Paul is calling us to plant seeds, specifically seeds of love and respect. Through Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is calling husbands uh, to love their wives repeatedly. And then he concludes Ephesians chapter 5 by calling the wife to respect the husband. Husbands, Uh, If we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church, as we saw last week, that's going to require us uh, loving her sacrificially, loving her redemptively, and loving her thoughtfully. What this means practically is that we love her in a way that she feels loved. We, We speak her love language, if you like. We are attentive to her needs. But more than that, we also invest in in her spiritual relationship with Jesus. Loving your wife doesn't simply mean meeting her needs. It also means at times helping shape her needs in a Godward direction. There's never a more loving thing that you could do for your wife than help her grow in her relationship with Jesus. Wives, we're called here in Ephesians 5 verse 33 to respect our husbands. How can I respect my husband? Well, the essence of what this passage is asking us is really to honour their lead by embracing and upholding it and giving him the respect that is due him. If I was to double click on the word respect, it would help by giving us other words that help to show us what that means, such as esteem, regard, admire, appreciate, praise, cherish, value, prize, treasure. Contempt would be an opposite word, which we can sometimes show in subtle ways. These words conveying respect help us to remember that the goal is to build our husbands up. How are we doing here? What is the flavor of our attitude towards our husbands? Is it one that's seeking to build him up with our words and actions? Or is it one that reveals contempt by tearing him down? Respect can be shown and worked out in a variety of ways, and each couple is unique, and it takes time to work out how a husband would feel respected in each marriage. Not a lot of detail is given in this text, which means there's so much scope to work out and be creative and to enjoy the process of discovery as you go along. As wives, we get to be a powerful force for good by nurturing, encouraging, and affirming the lead of our husbands. And we're freed from competing and striving with him, which is wearying for us and undermining of him and not a blessing. We're a team, and a key part of the success of this team is affirming his leadership role and esteeming him as a person. Next, we want to highlight the importance of watering. A good gardener will tell you that a big part of the job uh, is just showing up and watering the garden when it seems like nothing is growing. A mature marriage, like a mature garden, requires time and seasons and patience. It requires us to sow seeds, uh, to water, to be patient and wait. 
an inexperienced gardener could walk into a garden and see no growth and declare everything to be dead and throw in the towel and, and walk away. But a mature gardener knows better. A mature gardener knows that patience and diligence is required. Friends, if you're married at the moment and your marriage is in a low growth moment, can I encourage you not to be despondent or to give in to despair, but can I encourage you to continue to sow, to continue to water, continue to look to God and anticipate future growth? It's easy in a marriage like in a garden just to try and throw money at this, right? We, we, we can get fake grass or instant lawn or artificial flowers. But if you're after the real thing, it is going to require time and effort. Ephesians 5.29 tells us that actually it's going to require daily attention. The next thing that we need to be doing is pulling weeds. In any marriage, like in a garden, it's not just the good stuff that grows, right? It's, it's the bad stuff as well. If your garden's anything like mine, then, then, then the bad stuff, the weeds grow without any attention, right? They, they, they just seem to grow automatically. And if you don't start pulling them out, they have a way of trying to take over the garden. Of course, there's always the uh, temptation just to kind of mow them down and cut them off at the head, without leaning down and pulling them out at the root. But if you do this, you know that the weeds simply grow back. A massive part of growing and maturing as a married couple is uh, by diligently pulling out the weeds in your own life and indeed in your married relationship. I actually want to suggest to you that there is no better environment to pull out weeds in your life than in the context of Christian marriage. God has designed Christian marriage to uh, sit uh, in the cradle of a lifelong covenant relationship. What this means is that when marriage is at its best, the person who knows you at your worst is actually the person who loves you the most. This mirrors the gospel. This mirrors Christ's love for us. And it's in this very context where we can safely pull out the weeds in our lives, where we can deal with our stuff, where we can give and receive honest feedback about our over-desires or our disordered loves. It's, it's easy to try and ignore these weeds and hope they'll disappear, but, but that approach always comes back to bite. Much better to have the hard and difficult conversations in the context of a covenant relationship a conversation full of grace, truth, and hope. And finally, in this section, celebrating. Gardening requires way too much work for us to not celebrate the wins when we get them. And celebrating is essential to helping you feel involved and encouraged. It's essential to a maturing Christian marriage to encourage each other in your Christian growth, and it encourages you that God is at work through it all. We love the way that Tim Keller puts it. Within a Christian marriage, here's what it means to fall in love. It's to look at another person and to get a glimpse of the person God is creating and to say, I see the person that God is making you and it excites me. I want to be a part of that. I want to partner with you and God in the journey you're taking to his throne. And when we get there, I will look at your magnificence and say, I always knew you could be like this. I got glimpses of it on earth, but now look at you. Each spouse should see the great thing that Jesus is doing in the life of their mate through the word, the gospel. And each spouse then should give him, him or herself to be a vehicle of that work and envision the day that you will stand together before God, seeing each other presented in spotless beauty and glory. Now, you before you think that Keller's being a bit naive, he concludes... In this view of marriage, each person says to the other, I see all your flaws, imperfections, weaknesses and dependencies, but underneath them all, I see growing the person that God wants you to be. And we celebrate that as often as we can. So firstly, uh, cultivating the garden. Secondly, renew the covenant. 
Paul having called both husband and wife uh, to sacrificial Christ-like love, he then reminds us of the beauty of sexual intimacy within the context of marriage. And he does this by quoting from Genesis chapter 2 and reminding us of God's original creation intention. Paul reminds us, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Friends, the the, the Christian couple isn't uh, embarrassed about sexual intimacy in marriage, nor nor are they prudish, but but rather they realize that sexual intimacy within marriage is something that God has created for our enjoyment. Indeed, in the Bible, we have the book, The Song of Songs, which is in fact a celebration of sexual intimacy within marriage. What we see here in Ephesians chapter 5 that the context into which sexual intimacy is meant to grow and flourish and be enjoyed is in the context of a lifelong covenant relationship. Listen to what Tim Keller writes. The Bible says sex was not designed to be a consumer good. It was designed to be a covenant good. And here's what that means. See, in a covenant, when you've made a promise, sex becomes like a visible sign of an invisible reality. And that's why it's so meaningful. When you use sex inside a covenant, it becomes a vehicle for engaging the whole person in an act of self-giving and self-commitment. When I, in marriage, make myself physically naked and vulnerable, it's a sign of what I've done with my whole life. By giving up my independence and by making this promise. Sex is supposed to be a sign of what you've done with your whole life. And that's the reason why sex outside of marriage, according to the Bible, lacks integrity. Outside of marriage, you are asking somebody to do with their body what you're not doing with your life. You are saying, let's be physically vulnerable to each other. Let's do physical disclosure, but not whole life vulnerability. That's the reason why C.S. Lewis puts it perfectly. This is a perfect description of the biblical sex ethic. He says, the monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual, from all the other kinds of union which were intended to go along with it and to make up the total union. To have physical union without whole life union is to lack integrity. If you have sex inside a covenant, then sex becomes a covenant renewal ceremony. You're getting married all over again. You're giving yourself all over again. It's an incredibly deepening and solidifying and nurturing. In marriage, when you're having sex, you're saying, I belong completely and exclusively to you. I'm acting it out. That's what sex is. You, uh, I'm giving you my body as a token of how I've given you my life. I'm opening to you physically as a token of the fact that I've opened to you in every other way. That's how it's supposed to work. Sex becomes a deepening thing, a nurturing thing. It's like covenant cement, like like covenant glue, like like a covenant renewal ceremony. Friends, do you see how beautiful this is? Sex within the context of a covenant marriage is just simply a physical representation of what you have done with your whole body and whole life. Friends, that's why uh, as Christians, we we don't have a low view of sex within marriage. We have an incredibly high view. We don't see it as something that is casual or irrelevant or unimportant, but something that is beautiful and special and worth prioritizing. With this in mind, Anna and I would now like just to give some uh, pastoral counsel to married couples. The first thing that we want to share with you is that sexual fulfillment grows uh, as your marriage matures. Friends, God has uh, designed marriage to be a lifelong relationship. And what that means is that your relationship and your sexual relationship in particular has time to develop and grow and mature. And therefore, if you are relatively newly married and internally just a little bit disappointed by the state of your sex life, can I encourage you to give yourself time 
Can I encourage you not to become uh, depressed or glum about this, but rather look to God and realize that he has given you a lifetime to grow and develop and mature in this area. Secondly, get help if you need to. Some spouses and wives in particular feel that maybe there's something wrong with them if they don't enjoy sex. And they carry a sense of shame about this and they end up withdrawing and they don't want to embarrass their spouse and they themselves feel embarrassed. So they don't speak about it, they just withdraw and end up feeling isolated and helpless. Can we say to you that it's okay to talk to someone about it? In fact, we'd encourage you to seek help. Different people go through different struggles through their marriage and it would be very helpful to go and seek out a pastoral or a medical conversation about it. That would be really um, productive. Often, not always, but often, physical factors can play a significant role in sexual desires. Thirdly, we think that dealing with past and present uh, sexual brokenness is really important. Suffice us to say that unresolved sexual brokenness, either in the present or the past, will negatively impact uh, your sexual relationship within marriage. Dealing with this is vital for the sexual well-being of your marriage. Healing and forgiveness is possible in Jesus, but they need to be pursued intentionally. Fourthly, we would just like to remind you that uh, sexual intimacy uh, is about romance, not just the bedroom. When we, when we speak about sexual intimacy in marriage, often husbands can think about the bedroom, but the wives often think uh, about all of life and romance. If, if our marriages are to flourish, then it's important that we keep romance alive. Husbands, can I urge you to take a lead in the situation? Last week, we, we saw the leadership role that God has assigned for us uh, in marriage. And, and keeping your romance uh, alive in your marriage is something that I'd love you to take a lead in. I know this is a difficult time in lockdown, and I don't want to put guilties on anybody. Uh, but husbands, when, when was the last time that you uh, romanced your wife? When was the last time you really surprised her? When was the last time that you spoke her love language? When, did, when was the last time you did something that she found romantic? Can I encourage you to take an initiative in this? I know that these are financially difficult times, but friends, we don't need to spend money in order to be romantic. We can write uh, letters, we can speak tender words, we can give kisses and cuddles, we, we, we can be intimate in, in the morning, not, not, not just before we go to bed. Husbands, let's lead in this area. And fifthly, be available to each other. Scripture is clear. My body belongs to my husband and his to mine. As Song of Songs says, I am my beloved's and he is mine. And there is ownership and exclusivity here. We need to give of ourselves unreservedly and not withhold the pleasure of sex. When we choose to obey God and give our bodies to our spouses willingly, even when we don't feel like it, so often he rewards us with pleasure. As Elizabeth Elliot encourages us, the essence of sexual enjoyment is self-giving. You will find that, that it's impossible to draw the line between giving pleasure and receiving pleasure. If you put the giving first, the receiving is, is inevitable. Our attitude in the act of marriage needs, a bit, needs to be about giving and serving, not about using each other's body for our selfish, selfish satisfaction. Now to give three bits of advice to the wives specifically. Firstly, be anticipatory. As women, our brain is our largest sex organ, and how we think does actually influence our desire. Often before we marry, the desire can be strong, but when was the last time you spent the day thinking about your husband and looking forward to being intimate with them later that day? If you no longer think about your husband, you're no longer anticipating um, intimacy with him. When we neglect to think sexual thoughts, we should not be surprised by the lack of sexual desire. If we think anticipatory thoughts about our husband during the day, it will heighten our sexual longing. And it's interesting that the wife in Song of Songs goes into great detail about this as she thinks about her lover during the day. 
The wife's sensual musings culminate in the exclamation, he is altogether desirable, and her passion was ignited by her imagination. God has given you an imagination. Use it to daydream about your husband and think positively about him. Our longing should culminate in what Proverbs 5 verse 19 describes as intoxicating sex. Now, I know what it's like to be a mum with little kids and how exhausting it can be in that season. The last thing you feel like at the end of the day is intimacy with your husband. You've been giving all day and you would like to have some space and some peace and quiet. God understands. And it's okay to be honest about your husband with this. He may graciously decide to save it for another day or he may want to see you refreshed. Your marriage is of high priority and it's more important than many of the other tasks you give yourself to in life. Maybe if you're tired all the time, you need to think of ways that you can cut back on, your, on what you're doing during the day. Like evaluating your lifestyle, say no to things, take a shower to wake yourself up. If possible, get a nap during the day, but be creative and try and be proactive in solving the problem. This season of having little kids could be quite a long time and we can't be um, saying no all the time. So our mind's attitude and priority play a big role in this. Nextly, be active. Song of Songs is not a one-sided song, but a mutual exchange. She's eager and desirous for him. And in fact, she plays the primary role in the song. Old Testament scholar Tremper Longman writes, the role of the woman throughout the Song of Solomon is truly astounding, especially in the light of its ancient origins. It's the woman, not the man, who's the dominant voice throughout the poems that make up the song. She's the one who seeks, pursues, and initiates. Wives, God presents you here with a picture from the scriptures of a woman who seeks, initiates, and pursues. It is allowed. And finally, be adventurous. Jill Dillow says, the woman who would never think of serving her husband the same frozen television dinner every night sometimes serves him the same frozen sexual response every night. Sex, like supper, loses much of its flavour when it becomes predictable. Good point. Let's not allow it to become stale and predictable. Let's be creative and let's be adventurous. And ladies, by being connected to the creator of the universe, God wants to fuel our creativity in all areas of life, including our sex life. Ask him for help and inspiration and don't settle for less. He's got the best for you. So firstly, cultivate your garden. Secondly, renew the covenant. And finally, serve the king. Now, Paul concludes his instruction here in Ephesians chapter 5 with a surprising twist in the tale. Paul, having presented a magnificent gospel-infused vision of marriage, then concludes by saying, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Paul intentionally jolts married couples because he wants to make sure that at an absolute foundational level that their marriage is about God, that it is for Christ, that it is about serving the king. Friends, as Christian married couples, we can make a mistake by making our marriage about our wants, needs, and desires, or, or even just uh, us as husband and wife. What is clear from the instruction here is that the ultimate goal of your marriage should be glorifying God, should be honoring the king. C.S. Lewis gets this spot on when he says the following, when I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Insofar as I've learned to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, I shall be moving towards the state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but increased. Friends, do you see what Lewis is saying here? Lewis is saying the degree to which you put God first in your life and in your marriage is the degree to which you are actually truly loving your spouse. And the opposite is true as well. The degree to which you make your spouse the focus of your marriage is the degree to which actually you are moving towards a state in which you do not love them at all. 
when first things are put first, says Lewis, second things like marriage and your spouse aren't suppressed, but they're enhanced. And therefore, it is absolutely critical as married couples that we put God first uh, in our lives and that we put God first in our marriage. Friends, your, your marriage is never in a better and a healthier place than when you are serving God individually and when you are serving God as a couple, when your marriage is pointing to Christ and the church. Friends, marriage working at its best is when each of us is encouraging each other in a Godward direction, when, when husband and wife are on a mission together. And friends, there are innumerable ways that you can encourage your spouse spiritually. You, you, you can pray. You can pray for your spouse. In fact, nobody knows your spouse better than you do. You, you, you can be the best intercessor for them, but you can pray together. You can also go with them to prayer meetings. You can be committed to prayer. You can be listening to sermons together, having spiritual conversations, uh, encouraging each other with spiritual disciplines. When we're able to regather at church, when your spouse doesn't feel like going to church, you can say, come on, let's go to church. Let's, let's meet together with God's people. I, I'll have the kids uh, this afternoon. You, you can be that kind of spiritual encouragement. You, you can buy, buy them Christian books. You, you can be intentional about ministering together. Uh, for Anna and I this year, that, that means uh, being hospitable at, uh, at the start of the year when we could, but, but, but also leading online uh, life group and alpha and being a part of the advanced theological uh, training, ministering to other couples. We, we've been proactive in serving together as a couple. In addition to that, we've also encouraged one another in our different individual ministries. For you, that may be your spouse marketplace calling. We, we have a, a great opportunity to be cheerleaders and encouragers uh, of our spouse's uh, spiritual growth and development. And friends, when we do that, there is a double joy. Uh, the first joy is actually seeing them grow and develop in their spiritual relationship. But the second joy is actually we will grow together in intimacy. Uh, the Apostle John describes a wonderful kind of gospel love triangle in 1 John 1 verse 7, where he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, speaking of Jesus, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another. Isn't this really interesting? You'd think if we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, that we'll have fellowship with Jesus but John tells us that if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another. And that's so true in marriage. When you put God first in your marriage, when you pursue Jesus each individually, you don't just grow closer to Jesus, but you grow closer to each other because Jesus becomes uh, the uniting force in your marriage. Friends, can I encourage you as husband and wife to pursue loving Jesus? And as you pursue loving Jesus, remember that you love him because he first loved you. That the only way that we get to do Christian marriage is in the power of the gospel and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's only when we truly embrace Jesus and his saving work for us. It's only when we truly embrace the gospel it's only when we truly filled with the Holy Spirit that we can be the husbands and wives that God has called us to. Let's pray. Father God, we just are in awe of you. What an amazing God you are. Thank you that you are a God of love. And I thank you that you've created us to reflect your image to the world and in our marriages to reflect more of what you are like. We're so grateful to you for this teaching as well and for showing us the way. And we don't want to leave people feeling daunted by the task ahead of this marriage, but rather inspired that there's a beautiful picture for us to aim for, something that's so beautiful in contrast to what our culture shows us. And I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord God, and would you give hope to every person, wherever they may find themselves today, Lord God, whatever their marital status is, Lord. Would you breathe hope and would you bring redemption to places of difficulty and hurt? We pray for gospel renewal in marriages. We pray that couples would look to the king and seek to make him famous through their marriages. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We want to conclude today by showing you a short three-minute video by our good friend Andrew Wilson, who helps us appreciate the wonder how husband and wife is actually about Christ and the church. God bless. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Symbols, shadows, parables. Sometimes this is about that. Flowers are about love. Signatures are about promises. Fireworks are about celebrations. Poppies are about war. And marriage is about the Christian gospel. This mystery is profound, says Paul, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So the wedding begins with the groom waiting at the front. He has pursued his bride and won her, and now he just has to wait. And when she eventually comes in, the whole room stands and stares at her beauty, her immaculate dress, pure and white and spotless. She gets presented to him, and they declare that they have no other partners. They hold hands. They make promises to have and to hold, for better, for worse forsaking all others as long as we both shall live. They exchange rings, signs of the covenant promises they have just made. They sign their names and make their vows legal. Then, as the ceremony concludes, they walk back out again, united as one. Everything he has is hers, and everything she has is his. Everybody celebrates with a meal. Later, they will express their physical union and share all of their possessions. She even takes on his name. Two have become one. And all this is about that. Jesus has made his people ready. His death for our sins has made us beautiful, pure, white, and spotless. We are given to him and to nobody else. We make promises to each other. Never will I leave you or abandon you, says Jesus, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. And we reply to him, I will forsake all other gods as long as we both shall live. There is an exchange of gifts. God gives us his spirit. There is a legal declaration. God says we are righteous in his sight. And we walk on, united as one. Everything he has, his love, his power, his goodness, becomes ours. And everything we have, our sin, our shame, our past, becomes his. Everybody celebrates with a meal, bread and wine. We express our physical union through baptism in water. We give him access to all our possessions. We even take on his name and his identity. We become Christians. Two have become one. This is about that. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we trust that you've had a, a great time with us and we trust that you all will have a great week. God bless and goodbye. Bye.